sadly did not live to see the construction of his monument. He died in 1876 and the telescope wasn't completed until 1888. And so he is buried at the base of the telescope. And so the telescope is quite literally his tombstone. And uh, it very quickly after the observatory opened, started, started showing its merit as indeed the greatest telescope in the world. Uh, the telescope was actually ready for use on January 1st, 1888. The weather was poor, it snowed, so they couldn't use it on January 3rd. They were able to open up the dome and uh, they were able to view Aldebaran and discover that the focus of the telescope was not correct. They had mismeasured the focal length of his monument, uh, his telescope, and the telescope was about six inches too long. Uh, so they determined that and over the next few days fixed the telescope, made it shorter, and so on January 7th, James Keeler made the first scientific discovery on the first science night with this telescope. He looked at Saturn and he discovered a new gap in the rings of Saturn, and he dubbed it the Enki division or Enki gap. Um, later, of course, to honor James Keeler, when Voyager went by Saturn, they discovered a new ring in the A, a new gap in the A ring and named it the Keeler name gap in his honor. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So that was the first big discovery. And of course, many discoveries quickly followed. Edward Emerson Barnard discovered Amalthea, Jupiter's fifth moon, fifth moon. You can see his log book there in the picture. And of course, Amalthea has since been imaged directly by the Galileo spacecraft in recent time, so we know what it looks like. Um, it was the last moon in our solar system discovered visually, which is by someone viewing with their eye through an eyepiece. All subsequent moon discoveries in our solar system were made using photographic techniques. Um, another interesting thing with, that was being done when we first started Lick Observatory was uh, Edward Holden, the first director of Lick Observatory, was really fascinated by the moon. And so he had a program to take the moon at all different phases um, because along that terminator line between light and dark on the moon, of course, you get very high contrast views of the craters and um, mountains and other features on the moon. And he, you know, wanted to study that, you know, of course, we were still trying to figure out a lot of what the moon was about back then in the late 1800s. Uh, just last week, you might have seen this new image created by amateur astronomer Andrew McCarthy doing very much what Edward Holden was doing, taking pictures of the moon at all different phases, and he stitched them together to make this incredibly high contrast image that I'm sure Edward Holden, would he be alive today, would very much appreciate. Um, that shows all the craters in great detail. Anyway, so that's the early history of Lick Observatory that really put it on the map as one of the greatest uh, observatories in the world at the time. Now we're gonna race forward a couple decades to talk about the Spanish flu and see how research changed and evolved. Um, so I've got a quick little timeline here, um, as well as some photos about the, the you know, showing some of that what it was like during the Spanish flu. But really the important date is in April 1917, the US entered World War I. Now World War I started in 1914, so it took many years for the US to become involved in World War I. And in June of 1917, a draft was instituted to get enough young men to fight in the war and go to Europe. Of course, with so many people going to Europe, uh, you know, the, the flu, we believe, started in Europe and, uh, you know, with soldiers going back and forth, the flu came to the United States in March of 1918. The next month, the first severe cases and deaths occurred. Um, and by September of 1918 was the second wave of the flu. And, you know, at Camp Devon outside Boston, they had over 14,000 flu cases. And of course, the New York City Board of Health was making sure that people with the flu were isolated um, to prevent the spread. Um, of course, in October of 1918 was the um, you know, most massive death toll. Over 195,000 people died in that month. There were shortages of healthcare workers. Chicago and other cities started taking measures such as closing schools, movie theaters, uh, prohibiting large public gatherings. Um, San Francisco Board of Health started requiring people to work, wear face masks. This should all feel kind of familiar given our uh, current situation. Um, and of course, 
things started to get better and World War I ended, but as the soldiers came home, they brought more flu cases with them from Europe. And so there was a third wave in early 1919 of the flu. And, you know, just for, you know, local perspective, in the first five days of 1919, there were over 1,800 flu cases and 100, over 100 deaths in San Francisco alone. Um, a month later, things started abating, but the flu epidemic was still raging in Europe and President Woodrow Wilson, uh, in the photograph there, um, collapsed the Versailles Peace Conference. And they believed that it was because he was weak from influenza, which was still rampant in Paris and, and other cities in Europe. Um, and you know, the sobering fact is that between 20 and 50 million people died from the Spanish flu uh, worldwide. And uh, you know, keep in mind that the population of Earth was somewhere around one and a half billion people at that time compared to our over seven billion people today. What I learned in looking up the history of the Spanish flu at Lick Observatory was that it was actually not the flu itself that caused terrible problems at Lick Observatory, but more the fact that we were involved in World War I. Many of the researchers, while they may not have been of draft age, uh, they used their technical expertise to help the um, war effort so that many of them, uh, such as Heber Curtis, uh, was actually working for the, the War Department rather than working at Lick Observatory. So there was a drain on staff and uh, research did slow down during this period. So what did Lick Observatory look like back in 1918? Well, here's a little satellite map um, from Google. And if you can see my little red cursor here, you know, essentially everything east of uh, the center of town there didn't exist back in 1918. Uh, so many of the telescopes weren't there, the houses weren't there. Um, and there were barns and workshops and other things that, that no longer exist there. So really the, the focus of the observatory was the western half of our current observatory. Of course, we have the main historic building. Um, the photographic building right here was built in uh, about 1907. The laboratory mat, uh, measurement building here didn't exist. Instead, in that location um, was the Meridian Transit Circle instrument. And uh, down here at the lower left, you can see a picture of what the transit instrument looked like. Um, of course, we had the two main telescopes with the 12-inch Clark refractor and the 36-inch Clark refractor, as well as some of the historic houses which still exist, such as the Barnard House where E.E. E. Barnard lived, the director's house where uh, William Wallace Campbell lived, the Crosley Telescope. Um, so it was a very different looking place back then, um, but it did enable them to do a lot of research. One of the main research topics that was covered and, and very important in 1918 was um, trying to test Einstein's theory of relativity. Now, back in the 1918 uh, flu epidemic, there weren't really travel restrictions so that the, the researchers could actually go to Goldendale, Washington to do the scientific endeavors and try to confirm Einstein's theory of relativity. So Einstein's theory of relativity um, you know, says that if you have a large mass that deforms space and that, you know, curves space and so that if you have a, you know, light will curve and bend. So to test Einstein's theory, they had a plan to go to the total solar eclipse and take photos during the eclipse to show the stars near the sun and then measure their positions very accurately. And Heber Curtis he uh, actually took a leave from his uh, wartime duties to participate in this uh, total solar eclipse. He ordered these lovely glass um, uh, ruled scales that they would use to very accurately measure the position of the stars on the photographic plates. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and then compare that to where the star positions would be when the sun isn't in the way and see how much the light was deflected. They had tried to do this same experiment with an eclipse expedition to the Ukraine in 1914. Uh, that was, expedition was unsuccessful because the weather was poor, so they got rained out, there were too many clouds, too much poor weather. And then World War I started. 
And so the poor researchers were there kind of stuck in Russia. Uh, they were originally going to go through, um, you know, Central Europe to uh, get back to the United States. That proved impossible with the outbreak of the war. So the researchers had to actually divert and, and manage to get back to the U.S. via Finland and a rather circuitous route. But they couldn't bring their equipment with them. It got stuck in Russia uh, with, and, and uh, left in storage with some trusted colleagues there. And unfortunately, by 1918, because the war was raging on, they could not get the equipment back to the United States in time. So they had less than optimal equipment that they built from what they had available here in the US. They borrowed some lenses for their telescopes from Chabot Observatory, as well as to the best they could. They set up in Goldendale, Washington on June 8th, uh, about 400 feet north of the Eclipse Central Line. And it was poor weather. So uh, they again were unable to get good enough data to measure uh, and confirm Einstein's theory of relativity. But a few minutes before the eclipse started and very soon after the eclipse ended, um, they had a small break in the cloud. So they were able to get some data, but the data were insufficient to prove Einstein's theory of relativity. That would have to wait till the 1919 eclipse and uh, Eddington's research and eclipse data. And that wasn't truly definitive. So we didn't really confirm Einstein's theory of relativity um, until 1922 when William Wallace Campbell of Lick Observatory went to Australia and was able to get very good data from that um, total solar eclipse. So that was one, you know, not quite successful aspect of the 1918 research. But uh, another thing that was being done was timing of the eclipse. They were still fine tuning, you know, the orbit of the moon and, and things like that. And so Mr. Tucker was using that meridian circle at Lick Observatory months in advance of the eclipse, measuring very accurately the position of the moon so that they could accurately predict what time the total solar eclipse would begin. And uh, his measurements indicated that things would, you know, the eclipse would totality would start about 20 seconds earlier than the nautical almanac. And when they actually measured the eclipse, uh, they found that it was 16.6 .6 seconds in advance of the almanac predictum. So they was, that was very successful and showed that, that Lick Observatory's instruments were truly among the best in the world. Um, other research was looking at the coronal and flash spectra. So this is, of course, the corona is usually completely overwhelmed by the brightness of the sun, so you can't see it. So it's only during a total solar eclipse that you can really get good um, idea of what um, the spectrum of the corona looks like. So they had a telescope set up with a Roland plate grating with over 14,000 lines per inch. So diffraction gratings, the more lines per inch you have, the more it spreads out the light. So, um, so you can see all the details of the spectrum. Um, you can see the top image here. We've got the solar spectrum here, the continuum spectrum, and then you have the coronal spectrum. And you can see mostly continuum, but you might see these little bright lines here and there associated with like hydrogen beta emission and such. So they knew the wavelengths of some of these lines, but there's one that was a puzzle for a very long time called this green coronal line or green coronium, coronium line. Um, we still today call it the green coronal line, even though we now know what causes it. Um, but this bottom spectrum here, you can see these little lines above and below the spectrum. Those are caused by iron. They use, uh, they, they, you know, uh, vaporize some iron to, as a calibration. And then there's this weird line. So one of the things they accomplished with the 1918 eclipse was um, really measuring the wavelength of this green coronal, coronal line well. Um, but they didn't know what it was. They also looked at some of the prominent spectra and that, but you can see in this little, uh, excerpt from the paper that was written on this, that they had a lot of wavelengths of lines that they didn't know what they were from yet. Um, and then, you know, of course, the, the prominence has many lines, some of them identified as being from hydrogen or calcium or helium. Um, of course, other spectra include even strontium and, and some other known wavelengths. Um, but today, we know that that line at 5303 angstroms is from very highly ionized iron. And it doesn't always show up in the coronal spectrum. 
So this is, a, is this, this modern spectrum is from an eclipse um, in 2008, and where that, that line is, is uh, almost non-existent, uh, whereas you can see much more strongly the, the regular hydrogen and helium lines that you expect to see. Um, so, you know, but, but that waxes and wanes. You know, do we know exactly why that highly ironized iron line shows up well sometimes and not others? Not entirely. So there's still research to be done there uh, with modern uh, instruments. Anyway, they were also looking at how the corona was polarized. And so they used a calcite cube, uh, a ROM, in front of uh, a double image camera so that they could get two images with different polarizations because calcite is a birefringent uh, mineral and so different polarizations, the light gets bent differently. So they could do that. They took uh, images in both green and blue filters to try and evaluate the uh, polarization. And what they found is that the blue images were slightly more polarized than the green images. And this is uh, mostly due to the fact that the shorter wavelength light the more it scatters. And polarization is usually caused by scattered light off of particles. Um, so that's why polarized uh, sunglasses work so well, because light that bounces off of water, snow, or pavement tends to become polarized. So if you use sunglasses with uh, the polarized sunglasses, you can block that polarized light and make it more comfortable. Yeah, so, so the same thing is happening here. You're having light scattering off of particles in the corona. And they got sufficient data that they could determine that most of the scattering was happening from particles more than 800,000 miles from the sun's lip. So they could get some limits on where the polarization was actually coming from. So as I said, solar astronomy and, and general relativity were the big topics of one of a couple of the big topics of the day. Another topic that was uh, getting a lot of research attention was spectroscopic binary stars and their orbits. Uh, Lick Observatory, while the US was very embroiled in World War I, they did send an expedition south to Santiago, Chile, the Mills expedition with a 36 reflecting telescope and a spectrograph. And they were observing, or one of the projects was observing spectroscopic binary stars. And so um, A. Carine, um, was uh, about a four, four and a half magnitude G5 star. It's actually a giant star, but if you look down here, you'll see our G5 spectrum, and you'll see these dark lines in there, these absorption lines. And to measure the orbit of a spectroscopic binary, you would actually look at those dark lines and see as the star in its orbit is moving towards you, those little black lines would move a little bit bluewards, and as it's moving away from you in the orbit, it would move a little bit redwards. So using the Doppler shift to do this. Now, these stars are going around each other. You know, we're, we're measuring things, you know, down to with, they were hoping down to the one kilometer per second uh, precision. And just to let you have a rough idea, if you have something moving 25 kilometers per second, the red shift of its line and the optical will be about, the, the change, it will be about half an angstrom. So they were using some of the highest resolution available gratings to make these measurements. Um, and of course, it took many years to get these data to sample the orbit a couple, you know, of these binary stars as they go around each other. Um, a Carine is nice. Its period is actually less than a year. It's uh, just uh, 195 days. And also, it's almost perfect sinusoidal um, curve here as, as, as it goes through the orbit. Um, and that means that it's, it's a, almost a perfect circular orbit that they determined uh, for this. Now, there's another spectroscopic binary and uh, uh, Delta Columbae, which has a very eccentric orbit. So when you look at the curve of when they were plotting the orbit, you can see it's uh, very asymmetric. And that's because it's a very oval or elliptical uh, orbit um, you know, with an eccentricity of, of nearly 0.7. So one star is, is uh, really whipping around very quickly as it moving towards us and then taking a much more slow path moving away in its redshift and then moving quickly towards again as it whips around its companion star um, in a very short 
period. Uh, but this one is, took much longer to acquire all the data because the period is 870 days or, or you know, somewhere between two and a half and three years. Um, solar system astronomy was also a hot topic back then. New comets were being discovered. Um, so Comet 1918 Shore was discovered by uh, uh, Shore and, and Germany. And then uh, astronomers like uh, Mr. Aitken at Lick Observatory, who later became director of Lick Observatory, and Edward Emerson Barnard, famous for discovering Amalthea here at Lick, who had since moved on to Yerkes Observatory. You know, we're taking plates and photographs of this uh, comet. You can see it's a very small fuzzball, um, did not have a big tail or anything, um, but they were able to fine tune its orbit and measure its period to be about 6.67 years. And also asteroids, you know, that, so uh, this is asteroid Arita was actually discovered in 1911 by Leuschner and, na and he named it after his daughter Arita. And, uh, but this shows um, just how progressive Lick Observatory was is that we had women using our telescopes to take data when places like Harvard College Observatory at the same time were not allowed and women to use the telescope the acquired by uh, Margaret Harwood at the Mariah Mitchell Observatory. Um, the data were analyzed uh, to figure out its orbit uh, by, by Mr. Jeffers here at Lick Observatory, and, and he actually did quite a lot of, uh, was quite a prominent um, astronomer here at the time. Uh, but again, they, they determined his orbital period to be uh, 5.3 years uh, with pretty, with, with very good accuracy. Um, I should also note that uh, University of California uh, first PhDs to women went to two female astronomers here at Lick Observatory. Um, so that we were much more progressive than certain other prominent observatories at the time when it came to women um, doing astronomy. So that's, uh, you know, the focus on the solar system. The next big topic of research, which was sort of taking a hiatus because Heber Curtis was working in the War Department with his technical expertise, but Heber Curtis had been studying um, nebulae and, uh, and particularly these spiral nebulae in our, uh, it, visible in pretty much any photographic plate. You can see this picture, there's, there's quite a few fuzzballs here, one spiral galaxy there. Now back then, they didn't know that these were galaxies outside our so uh, excuse me outside our milky way galaxy there was a big debate the great debate that happened in april 20 uh, sorry april 1920 uh, just over 100 years ago heber curtis was of the opinion that these nebulae were actually other island universes, essentially galaxies outside our own galaxy. Now the term galaxy didn't exist yet, um, that came later. Whereas Harlow Shapley of Harvard College Observatory believed that these were inside our galaxy and that there was no way the universe, universe could be so large as these other things could be, these, these spiral nebulae could be outside our, our galaxy. Um, it turns out Heber Curtis, of course, was right. Um, and, and very famously so. Uh, but uh, as I said, he, he took a lot of this. And a lot of this work was started by James Keeler, who I already mentioned is discovering rings of uh, uh, Enki Gap and the rings of Saturn. Um, but James Keeler died young. So Heber Curtis uh, took up some of the research that he had been doing, uh, particularly with photographs like this one through the Crosley Telescope. And that's a picture of uh, Heber Curtis at the Crosley Telescope here at Lick Observatory. So that's sort of a picture of where we were a hundred years ago with research and the pandemic. Um, now, of course, today we're in our own pandemic and I'm not gonna highlight too many things in this timeline, but uh, you know, it, it happened very quickly. It was at the very tail end of December that there was first announcement that there was a cluster of pneumonia cases that were unusual in Wuhan, China. Uh, and then in early January, we started to identify that the cause was a new novel coronavirus. Now, coronaviruses are very common. There are lots of different varieties. Um, many of them are responsible for the common cold. Um, 
but a few of them are responsible for more serious diseases such as SARS and now the, the current virus SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, by mid January 12th, the genetic sequence of the coronavirus had been established and uh, shared publicly, which of course was a boon to all the researchers trying to come up with vaccines and treatments and such. Uh, by January 21st, we had the first confirmed case in the US. Um, and uh, <clears throat> by the 11th of February, they, the, you know, they announced a formal name for the disease, excuse me, for the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2, which is COVID-19. Um, and then at the end of February, we had the first death of a person in the US from uh, COVID-19. Uh, things rapidly changed. Uh, we were sort of working as normal here at Lick Observatory until March 11th, when um, the WHO formally declared the outbreak as a pandemic. The number of global cases was over 100,000. Um, you know, it's becoming clear this is a serious health problem. So UC Santa Cruz um, decided at that point to suspend all in-person classes and move to remote instruction. And then the next day, we here at Lick Observatory decided we needed to take some action to protect our staff and um, public visitors from this uh, emerging disease and pandemic. So we enhanced our cleaning standards. We actually increased the number of times the bathrooms were cleaned every day, made sure we had hand sanitizer available, um, you know, disinfecting wipes, everything like that. We also wanted to ensure that you know, we provided um, masks and gloves for our staff that wanted to use them if it made them feel safer. Um, we also reduced the group size. One of the benefits of our visitor center is it's freely accessible to the public and we give free showings of the historic telescope, but that's usually for up to 40 people. There was no way we could have 40 people in that space safely. So we reduced the group size down to 20 people and uh, made sure there was enough space so that people could adequately space out and see the telescope safely. Um, it also became clear that we would not be able to hold our April and May events. Uh, our May public events, I canceled at that time and changed when our tickets would go on sale. Uh, as well as uh, canceled all our private events. We had a wedding schedule and some other fundraising events, um, which was very disappointing, <coughs> excuse me, for everyone. Um, you know, by uh, March 14th, um, you know, with, with people announcing schools are closing, you know, further reductions in the size of gatherings to be no more than 10 people, Lick Observatory, along with other museums in Santa Clara County, such as the Tech Museum, uh, decide to close to the public just for, for safety. Um, by March 17th, Santa Clara County uh, issued a uh, shelter in place order. I believe Santa Cruz County was a few days behind um, Santa Clara County in the Bay Area announcement, but uh, your shelter in place order was substantially the same as ours just a, a few days after. Um, and UC Santa Cruz decided that it would close campus except for people who were considered essential personnel. And that required ramping down a lot of research because while maintaining education activities is an essential function and supported um, research is not. And that was kind of disappointing. So at that point, a lot of stuff stopped here at Lick Observatory. Our remote observers could not get access to the remote operations rooms on the individual campuses. And, uh, you know, so we had to identify very quickly who on our staff were essential, what were essential functions to maintain the um, you know, integrity of our instrumentation and building so that things wouldn't degrade because of weather or neglect. Um, so it was, it, was a, it was a complicated time. And of course, by the 20th of March, the California statewide had a stay, uh, stay at home order and the total number of cases in the state exceeded a thousand people, a uh, thousand COVID-19 cases, which now sounds like a small number, but at the time was pretty dramatic. And of course the, the epicenter shifted from here in the Bay Area and Washington State to being New York City. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the cases just kept increasing, the numbers of deaths kept increasing. Of course, we're all very aware of this very, you know, 
sad statistics and, and how things are project, projected. Um, and because it was obvious things were getting worse very quickly, um, by April 9th, we had to make the painful decision that we had to cancel all our 2020 uh, summer series events, which includes all our Music of the Spheres uh, concert series, our Evening with the Stars uh, nighttime viewing programs, our public evening tours, our photography nights, all our pro uh, private events. Um, so it, it, was, it was a tough decision and we are hoping to bring Lick Observatory to the public virtually uh, this summer through uh, living room lectures and um, Ask an Astronomer events that we will hold online and those are currently in the planning stages. So we're not being idle here while things are shut down. We're actually working on quite a few different things. Anyway, um, one of the things we did starting in mid-March was started having a leadership team meetings. You'll see this is one of our Zoom meetings. So our director, Claire Max, our uh, deputy director, Matthew Chetrone, Costas Cloris, our mountain superintendent, and you know, a number, but not everyone is in each meeting. But uh, we started having them daily. And it was quite challenging because we'd come up with some policies or try to, to figure out how to implement what the university or county had announced for both Santa Clara County and Santa Cruz County. And uh, you know, by noon or by that evening, things will, would have changed. So it was a constantly moving target, uh, but we uh, did our best to make sure that we were abiding by everything. And really our, our mantra has been making sure people on Mount Hamilton are safe because we're a very small community. And if one person gets sick, it doesn't take much to have it propagate through our entire community. And if one person gets sick and is unable to work, it's very hard to, you know, we don't have a lot of people to cover those essential functions either. Um, so what did we end up shutting down? Well, pretty much we shut down all telescope operations with the exception of some robotic telescopes. And I'll talk about the robotic telescopes in a bit. Um, we worked on enabling as many staff as possible to work as much from home as possible. Of course, you know, making sure that people had, you know, computers or devices capable of doing Zoom meetings like this one, um, making sure they had adequate internet access at home. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that need to happen up here, such as just making sure our infrastructure stays sound, our water supply, um, heating systems, um, you know, for the robotic telescopes, our telescope operators were enabled to work from home so they can monitor the weather, monitor the robotic telescope operations to make sure that the telescopes are working properly. Um, and we also said, since we can't get to our remote operations rooms for our Shane and Nickel telescopes um, for, for our observers at the various UC campuses, um, we are going to start working on remote pajama observing software, as we're calling it. So we have the pajama observing mode, where you can observe from your own home rather than being from one of our uh, set up remote operations rooms. Um, so it took quite a while to get that working because we have very you know, strict firewalls. I wanted to make sure that only the right people were connecting and that everything was working properly. Uh, but uh, that worked. And so Nickel Telescope Pajama Observing actually started in mid-April. So it's been going on for a few weeks right now. Uh, we started with our most experienced, most savvy observers. Um, and we are now moving towards Pajama Observing with the Shane three meter telescope. That's a little more complicated. The Nickel Telescope we already have a, set, uh, a, a central staff going in there to fill the doers. Of course, our, our scientific cameras need liquid nitrogen to keep them cold. So we fill our uh, doers with liquid nitrogen once a day. So we already have a staff member going into the nickel telescope daily. He can change the filters and configure the instrument in the right way within a few minutes. So there was no real extra work uh, required to configure the telescope. So it was just a matter of getting the observers up to speed with the new software and getting it installed on whatever hardware they have. Now we are supporting Mac and Linux computers, not Windows computers. Uh, so, because you know, most of us don't have Windows computers to t adequately test things and there are other complications. Um, so our uh, robotic telescopes, APF, Kate and Panosetti, I'll talk about them in detail in a moment but they're all now operating normally as robotic telescopes. So uh, we are still getting science 
even though it's not quite as extensive as normal. Uh, Shane telescope and the 36 inch refractor are currently not operating because they require telescope operators to be in the building with the telescope. Um, we are working on the Shane telescope. In fact, last night, uh, we had our first night with actually a telescope operator in the dome as it approved research ramp up staff. Now that things are looking to relax a little bit, um, we're actually starting plans on how to ramp up research and get it back to where we were and do it safely, or at least get more done, uh, prioritizing students and uh, junior faculty and such that need, uh, you know, need data to progress in their careers more desperately than uh, established researchers like myself. Um, there are still things we can't do. Um, a lot of instrument upgrades and repairs are on hold. Um, our Shane Adaptive Optic System, which is my primary instrument I use here at Lick Observatory and work on, we're doing a big upgrade of the wavefront sensor um, stage to uh, help us expand how much uh, natural guide star uh, adaptive optics we can do. And that was, we were almost done. We were hoping to actually put it on the telescope with the, the newly uh, installed hardware at the end of March. Uh, since we had to stop work on it in, in mid-March, uh, it's, it's just been sitting there in the lab idle because we're not allowed to go into that small space with multiple people. And it requires two to three people to do the remaining work before we put it on the telescope. And we also have a repair for the tip tilt stage. And we also are starting construction on a new medium resolution spectrograph for the APF telescope called DARTS. And uh, that's, we still have engineers doing some design work, but the actual um, you know, acquiring of hardware and putting it together is on hold for the time being. Um, so lots of things have changed, but a lot of things are still going. In terms of the science we are actually accomplishing right now, uh, we are using the automated planet finder to find planets around other stars. So this is sort of similar in technique to how the spectroscopic binaries were being measured in 1918. That you have a planet orbiting a star and that tugs on the star and they orbit around their common center of mass. Now, of course, this is a hugely exaggerated animation, but uh, it does show how the star wobbles and how the redshift will go, um, you know, blue word as the star moves towards you and red word is that. Now this is a technique that was pioneered at Lick Observatory for discovering exoplanets with the Shane telescope and a very high resolution spectrograph equipped on it called the Hamilton spectrograph. Um, of course, we were so successful, we were able to get money to build a dedicated telescope, the Automated Planet Finder, to do this. And so it's been working for many years, routinely discovering planets around other stars to add to the catalog of now thousands of known planets around other stars. When we started this research with the Shane Telescope, there, you know, there, there was only one exoplanet known outside of our, uh, uh, known at the time we started this, this technique. Um, Another aspect that's still going on with the APF telescope is the Breakthrough Listen program. And this is a program to search for laser signals from intelligent extraterrestrial life. We know we can use lasers to uh, encode communications uh, here on Earth. So why wouldn't uh, uh, possibly uh, another civilization do this? Most of the telescopes used with the Breakthrough Listen program are radio telescopes. So you're probably well familiar with the traditional uh, you know, radio telescope SETI programs, uh, such as were highlighted the movie Contact with uh, Jodie Foster and then the book Contact by um, um, uh, Carl Sagan. Um, anyway, the, the, we are looking for bright um, flashes of laser light, and lasers tend to have very discrete single wavelength light that's not typically emitted um, from stars. So we're looking for that in the spectra of these stars with known or suspected planets around them. Um, and the fun thing about this is that the breakthrough initiatives, all the data for this program are freely available to the public. So if you want to go do some of your own exoplanet or, or uh, uh, SETI research, you can actually go to this website and choose the automated planet finder and take a look at some of our data. And maybe you'll be the lucky one to discover laser signals from another civilization. 
So on a related topic uh, is Pano SETI. This is our newest instrument on Mount Hamilton. Uh, so this Pano SETI stands for Pulsed All Sky Near Infrared Optical SETI. So it's, it's quite an acronym. Um, some of you might recognize this is the old um, Carnegie Dual Astrograph Dome. We've actually refurbished the dome. The telescope is still in there, but uh, we've parked the dome so it's pointed south all the time. And we've automated the dome shutter so it'll open and close on its own given good weather. And um, you can see the two cameras here mounted at the bottom of the slit. So what they're doing is sort of drift scanning the sky. So they just look in a fixed direction straight south and the sky, of course, moves over them. And they're looking for laser signals, pulsed laser signals from other civilizations. So similar in concept to what is being done with uh, the automated planet finder. Um, they're using these really wonderful sort of multi-pixel photon counters or MPPCs that are sensitive for all the way from 300 nanometers, which is in the near UV, all the way down to 1650 nanometer wavelengths in the near infrared. And uh, so this is a test program being run by Shelley Wright at UC San Diego. And if it's successful and they get the proper funding, they will build cameras that will view the entire sky from a site and hopefully have multiple cameras at various locations around the world so that they can monitor the sky all the time from, you know, and, and, and have full coverage and have a higher uh, chance of actually detecting intelligent life. So we're very excited to have this new instrument that was just recently installed on Mount Hamilton. And of course, our last robotic telescope is the Katzman Automatic Imaging Telescope, or CATE for short. Um, it's been in operation since 1998. It's a 30 inch diameter telescope. And here you can see a picture I took of all our grad students that were at last year's workshop uh, on, uh, astro on uh, observational astronomy that we hold every year. We're not sure we'll be able to hold it in the same way we normally do because of COVID. There normally takes place in October and it's hard to predict now whether we'll be able to hold events like this safely uh, by the time October rolls around. But the sole purpose of this telescope is to discover supernovae. And so here's, you know, supernova, you know, typically looks like a bright new star in a galaxy. So what the Kate telescope does is it points at a, at a galaxy, takes a picture, moves on to the next galaxy, and just cycles through them. And it can look at a thousand galaxies in a single night. And it compares the newly taken image of the galaxy with one taken the night before the last time uh, they got data on it uh, when the weather was good and to see, are there any new stars? If there are new stars visible in the image, it will go and flag it and say, we need more data. If a second image comes back with a new star in the same position, it will send email to the researchers saying, aha, I found a supernova and you need to go take a look at it and figure out more information. Uh, so usually with these supernova discoveries, we'll follow them up with the Shane telescope. Unfortunately, right now we're not able to use the Shane telescope for research. Uh, so we have a little hitch in our data acquisition and analysis pipeline right now. But, uh, you know, this, at least we're getting some data, we're discovering them. And, you know, back in 1998, when this telescope first became fully automated, it was the world leader in discovering supernovae and other galaxies. Since then, of course, many other telescopes have come into being to do similar, um, <clears throat> you know, discoveries. So we have changed the focus of the Kate telescope to actually look at fewer galaxies, but look at them more frequently. And in that case, we're hoping to find supernovae within you know, a day or even 12 hours of them going off. Because the sooner you discover a supernova, the sooner you can start studying it in detail because they get very bright very quickly and then take months to fade away. And it's that very, very rapid brightening period, um, you know, the very early stage of the supernova that we really don't have a lot of information about. So the sooner you discover one and get information, the better. Uh, there are two main types of supernova. There are type 1As, which are when a, uh, New, uh, sorry, a white dwarf star has a red giant companion and the red giant's atmosphere expands so much that uh, material starts 
accreting onto the white dwarf star, and when it hits 1.4 times the mass of our sun, it explodes. Uh, the nice thing about these type 1As are that um, they have the same intrinsic brightness because they always explode at the same mass. And so you can use them as very accurate way to measure the distance to a galaxy. And you can compare that distance to how fast the galaxy is receding from us and start to infer what is the future of our universe going to be? Is it, are things slowing down as you get further away because of gravity, you know, pulling things back in and slowing things down? Um, will the universe expand forever? Will it die in the big crunch? What they discovered in 98 uh, using the Cape telescope and, and some other telescopes around the world is that the universe is actually accelerating. It's getting bigger faster. So this was the discovery of dark energy that got the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Uh, and the Cape Telescope was, was part of that. Um, of course, there's another type of supernova called uh, Type 2, and that's when a star much more massive than our sun explodes at the end of its life and it runs out of fuel in its core. And uh, those, of course, are very dynamic. There are many different kinds, and they're interesting in their own right to try and figure out what happens in the, the early stages of those explosions, as well as the environment they're in, what are their progenitor stars, et cetera. So all that sort of research is continuing on with the Kate as normal. Um, Nickel telescope, as I mentioned before, was shut down um, initially because of our uh, shelter in place orders and need to only have essential personnel be in our buildings. Um, but as I said, we've, we've managed to get our pajama software running. So we now have students uh, again, running the telescope now for, for many, a few weeks. Uh, and most of the students are studying supernova light curves. So they're taking the data from the Kate telescope and other supernova discoveries from other uh, telescopes like the Zwicky Transit Factory and following them up and, and taking exposures every few nights of all these supernovae to measure how their brightness is changing to understand better the details of these. Um, we can also do targets of opportunity, which means if someone discovers a new comet or a, a, a new interesting object, um, we can use the nickel to follow up on it. Um, so one of the examples that we have done with the nickel, but is currently curtailed because LIGO has stopped operations because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but gravitational wave follow-up as well. Um, <clears throat> So here's some data that was taken just a couple nights ago of supernova 2020 HLA. So you can see, you know, right below the little red cursor is the galaxy, right above it is the supernova. Um, so students were running that, but this is the pajama software. You can see you can run your data taker, um, you have telescope control over here. So lots of exciting things. So it's very exciting to actually have, uh, be able to do observing from home. And we use Zoom sessions like this to actually talk to the observers as needed um, if they need to talk to a telescope operator or support astronomer. Um, and then, of course, gravitational waves, very exciting when you have something like two neutron stars orbiting around each other as they spiral in closer and closer together. They move faster and it leaves this nice gravitational wave you know, frequency plot that shows the characteristic chirp as they coalesce. And when they coalesce, if they're two neutron stars, that actually is an optical event. There's a lot of energy emitted in the electromagnetic spectrum, and you can actually see these with a telescope. Um, so one of the quirks of gravitational waves and, and that the discoveries made with LIGO is that they know pretty accurately the distance to the event, but the spatial identification of where it actually is in the sky is a little less determined. So there's a, a, a large area. And so what our student, our teams do when a, there is a gravitational uh, a kilonova event, as they're called, with two neutron stars, that uh, they have a list of galaxies that in, in a certain region, and they'll just observe galaxy, 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 in hopes of finding the bright new kilonova event in one of the images. It looks like a new supernova explosion um, in the data. Uh, so that, as I said, if LIGO were running, they would still be doing these follow-up studies. Uh, so we're, we're waiting on LIGO to uh, come back online after the, the COVID pandemic uh, as well. So as I said, I hope you see 
I hope you have an appreciation for some of the similarities in research being done now and 100 years ago, as well as the differences and how we're being affected differently in the two time periods by the pandemics and what the concerns were. Um, so in short, please stay safe and stay healthy until we can all meet in person again. And I hope I'll get a chance to come down to Santa Cruz and uh, see you all in person at some point. Um, at this point, we are planning for how we will reopen Lick Observatory for full research operations into the public so that we can keep everyone safe um, and, and uh, not worry about spreading uh, germs up here. And of course, all the normal you know, things you should do to keep yourself safe. And you know, in short, we will get through this crisis. It'll be hard, it'll take a while, but uh, science will continue and uh, new discoveries will continue to come from the observatory. So thank you. And thank you, Elder. <laughs> It took me a while to find my unmute button. I'm, I'm again trying to find my own stuff to stop sharing my screen and see, you know, other stuff. Ah, Let's God. see. I can probably still shut your screen off right there. Okay. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Now we can go back to lots and lots of my gosh, we have 30 people here. Oh my. Yeah. Okay. Great. Outstanding, Ellie. Thank you so much for putting this together and, and yeah, presenting so to I'm, our I'm happy to answer any questions yeah. anyone has. Yeah, hi, Ellie. Uh, this is Bob. And uh, I really appreciate that uh, presentation. That was so much information packed together and uh, great presentation. I, I guess I have a comment and a question. Mm -hmm. um, I remembered that um, back during World War I or just before World War I, when William Wallace Campbell, uh, you know, went to the Crimea, I think there was also a German astronomer, Freundlich, who uh, was there trying to, ca you know, confirm the Einstein mm -hmm. um, effect. And unfortunately for him, he was German, and so he was considered a prisoner of war. So he not only lost his equipment, he lost his, he was taken prisoner. Yeah, oh. and that was true for all the, the German uh, yeah, yeah. members of the research team. I, I can't remember how many there were, but yeah, it was very unfortunate for them. I mean, you know, the, the rest, you know, the, the yeah. Americans were quite lucky they were actually able to get out, though it was difficult. Right, so it just reminded me of a Feynman quote. Richard Feynman says, uh, you know, reality must take precedence over pr public relations for nature cannot be fooled. And yeah. so that's, we're scientists, are just seems like we confront um you know po political realities a lot of times and uh and then the politics really needs to take a back seat sometimes to the science anyway so that's my comment but i just wondered uh, also what financial impact you know we we had you unfortunately had to cancel the summer programs which i'm very sorry about but uh I wondered if you could comment a little on financial impact. Yeah, so financial impact on our public programs, uh, because they are entirely self-funded, including our, our gift shop and everything, is, you know, we have zero income coming in, and yet I still have some gift shop staff and stuff I'm paying. So we're, we're losing money. Um, we're hoping that as things relax, that maybe I'll be able to reintroduce some small events. So I'm trying to do some creative thinking to help um, bring in our uh, a, an income stream at some point, maybe late in the summer or in autumn. Um, fortunately, because I'm a fiscally conservative person, I'm good at planning. I had a buffer of funds so that we should be okay with, with the staff we need to pay. You know, some of our staff aren't working um, because there's no work for them to do. And I'm very sorry about that. And I hope they'll be able to collect unemployment. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just unfortunate. But for those people we do still have on staff, you know, I have enough to carry us through this season. If we have to cancel 2021 as well, I'm not entirely sure what we'll do, but with, I've got a year to think about creative things if that looks like that might happen. But I'm very hopeful that maybe things will relax and maybe we'll be able to introduce small, say, 10-person tours or something to, to bring in some 
uh, income. And we know there's a demand for people wanting to come up here and view through the telescopes and they're all disappointed that they can't do that right now. So we want to uh, help that out as well. You guys should print a Corona t-shirt. <laughs> you know, corona at Lick. And just, uh, I'm not really kidding. Uh, I, I'm involved with the organization of a major amateur star party that's been canceled this summer. Yeah. And so the uh, guys that organize it put together this t-shirt. And, oh, and they like sold, that. in two weeks, they sold 180 of them. Wow. Okay. The, the cow is because the t-shirt is on a dairy ranch. <laughs> Or, yeah. Sorry, Star Party is on a dairy ranch. Right, right. And, and there's always a cow theme in there. And somehow we got the Corona Borealis squeezed in there. <laughs> that's, that's great. That's very clever. Yeah. Well, as I said, we, we are planning to uh, do that. Oh, I see someone in the chat has said, do we have an online shopping option? Yes, we do. In fact, we added products to our online gift shop for Lick Observatory, including children's astronomy books and activities and jigsaw puzzles because people need things to keep themselves busy during uh, the shelter in place as well as wanting to enhance their children's education. So, so you can support our gift shop with online orders. I have a question for you, Ellie. So while you were putting this amazing presentation together and doing the research for, from you know, 100 years ago, what were some of the challenges that you faced pulling this that old data together? There's probably a bunch more f fun things that you found that you couldn't fit into the presentation. Uh, it, th also. There certainly were more fun things I couldn't fit into the presentation. And as it was, my presentation ran a little bit longer than I had originally planned because apparently I like to talk. Um, fast. <laughs> but um, yeah, my biggest challenge was I had to just make do with what materials were available online because as a non-essential employee, I am not allowed to go into any of the telescope observatory buildings or archives. And it's frustrating because I can see them all from my house. I can walk <laughs> up to the building, but I am not allowed to go in the door. And of course our archives have all these amazing photographic plates and all these log books and uh, you know, and and all the the you know research publications. So so so, do you have a list of things that you want to go check on since you did this research? Oh when yes. you do get access. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love the history here and having access to our archives, which are extensive and, and wonderful. Um, I, I really, yeah, I wish there was a way to make our archives um, more available to the public. Uh, but that's a big money and big project endeavor, which I haven't Huge. gotten a grant for yet. Um, we had a talk a uh, year or two ago by a, a visiting artist who was, I guess, in residence up there at Lick, and I can't remember his name. Oh, that was probably Russell Crotty. That's it. Yeah. And he, he did a fabulous talk on, mm -hmm. uh, showing all these things that he considered to be art objects, but were actually science-related things from yeah. Lick's archives. Well, one of the things I love about scientific instrument because I'm an instrumentationalist uh, if by training and uh, is that the craftsmanship that went into the instruments being built a hundred years ago was much different from the craftsman. I mean right now everything's functional and efficient and it's beautiful for that but back then you know it was these beautiful brass instruments with you know fine tooling and, and you know lovely engravings and such and they, they took pride in the artistry as well as utility and uh, so, so yeah, those, those historic instruments are great. D does Dave Cowley still run the uh, instrument shop at, on campus? Uh, yes, actually he recently retired, but ah. he's just been recalled from retirement to work on a few projects because we are short staffed and we have many grants. I mean, that's one thing I didn't mention in my talk is that most <laughs> of the work in the instrument shops at UC Santa Cruz is on hold because they're not allowed to go into the buildings and go into the machine shops. Um, there are a few exceptions. So we have a couple staff in there that are covering shipping and receiving functions. Um, so a little bit of work is being done, but we have a lot of NSF and other funders for creating instruments for Lick Observatory, Keck Observatory, and now the 30 meter telescope. And those are all running behind schedule. We're doing as much as we can from home, but, uh, 
you know, there are certain things that are just going to have to wait till people can get access to the physical facilities at UC Santa Cruz and our shops again. Well, Ellie, I just want to make a comment now that I learned how to unmute my screen here is a uh, thanks for this trip uh, through lick time as far as the first mm -hmm. hundred years. So look forward to the future uh, presentations and uh, online episodes. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. You'll be better, more entertaining than Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm a big Doctor Who fan. <laughs> I almost put a TARDIS background in, behind me for my talk, but decided that the, you know my home was just going to have to be enough. <laughs> the great refractor is enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep, Ellie, Ellie, yeah. um, I, I, I want to make sure I, I got this correctly. I've heard this, but you said that when there is a... Uh, uh, supernova explosion mm -hmm. it, it's it's always at the same mass for the type 1a supernovae yes the, I the see so no matter the size it goes down and we know that when there is the explosion then that's how we calculate its distance by the light yes for the type 1a supernovae yeah. because the type 1a has a constant mass mm -hmm. all over the universe. Right, right, oh. to the best of our understanding. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there may be things we don't understand yet because, you know, yeah. things aren't, you know, per, you know, they're not perfectly identical, which is why we still study them because yeah. we see some subtle differences and stuff and we're trying to figure out, is that just extinction from dust along the light path between us and yeah. the galaxy? or is that something intrinsic? So, so there is a lot of research into the, the nitty gritty details of type 1a supernovae. But for okay. the most part, yeah, they're, they're all the same brightness regardless of where they happen in the universe to the oh. best of our understanding. Very cool. Thank so you. The, Your talk was just wonderful, thank you. The, the 1a supernovas, those are the ones that start with a neutron star that accretes they, hydrogen. They start with a white dwarf star. Yeah. A white dwarf. White dwarf, yeah. And it accretes hydrogen from a yeah. neighbor, and then when it hits a critical mass, it's a giant H-bomb, basically. That's exactly right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Eleanor, I gather that the, the uncertainty about the you know, 1a supernovae, uh, that was still not so much to make people still think there's such a thing as dark energy. Yeah, no, this is, it's, yeah, the, the, the uncertainties in the supernova 1A measurements are very small compared to the overall trends we see indicating dark energy. So uh, the, the dark energy discovery is, is pretty firmly established at this point. Um, no. Not to say that there might not be something we don't understand. You know, science evolves and we think we understand something and then we learn something new and our opinion has to, or our, our knowledge changes. But, uh, but that's how science works. It's what makes the job fun. Eleanor, uh, you, you also mentioned that these students are looking and they'll see one day and then see something the next day and mm -hmm. like that. Well, if these things are doing this within the day time frame, and it's been going on for quadrillions of years or whatever, these things, there must just be 10 to the whatever happening every day all over the universe. Is that a correct assumption? You know, I, I don't actually know the statistics of how many, you know, must be happening. I mean, we, we have some estimates of how many galaxies there are and how frequently supernovae mm -hmm. happen. Um, but I don't actually know universe wide how many that would be per day or per century. Um, but but, but it, it would seem that if if something is visible today mm -hmm. it, not today and tomorrow that's that's 24 earth hours that's just <laughs> nothing yeah yeah and, yeah it, and if sufficient people are seeing that the mind yeah. just comes out of your skull trying to deal with that yeah but i mean we discover hundreds of supernovae explosions a year with yeah. our telescopes around the world so yeah. you know it's it, yeah they're happening pretty frequently uh, there are a lot of stars in the universe that reach the end of their lives so uh, yeah. back to kilonovas um so i 
thought of another question uh, uh, was uh, while LIGO is shut down, mm -hmm. um, it seems like it's still possible to figure the distance. You already know the distances of a lot of these galaxies and you're hopping around surveying mm -hmm. the galaxies for, and you could tell that this is not just a type 1a supernova or any supernova, it's a kilonova. It's like uh, two neutron stars colliding. Um, even without the chirp uh, signal, uh, you, you would get pretty good uh, spectral, at least if it's close enough, you can get spectral lines and figure out the elements that are created. Is that true? <clears throat> in principle, that is true. Since I'm not directly involved in that research, I just help the students get things configured to do their target of opportunity observations. I don't actually know the details. Um, but yes, I mean, they believe that, you know, things like gold, and, and such are, you know, pretty much all the gold in the universe was created in these kilonova explosions, um, as well as certain other, uh, you know, platinum and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, so they, they can, you know, will eventually be able to discern these sorts of things. Um, I'm not sure how advanced it is. I mean, you know, gravitational waves are pretty new in being able to detect them and detect these sorts of events. And of course, we're just entering this era of uh, multi-messenger astronomy where we're using, you know, electromagnetic waves, particles such as neutrinos, gravitational waves, uh, who knows what we'll figure out in the, the future given this multi-messenger astronomy era that we've entered. Yeah, thanks. Ellie, I was fascinated to uh, find out you're watching the supernova or some galaxies to catch the early a part of the supernova. What happens in the? What happens if you don't catch it? What happens in the first few? Is it hours, minutes, days? I mean, I you know, I don't know what the soonest the Kate telescope has caught a supernova, but I think it's on the. Or, you know, our goal is to catch it about twelve hours after the explosion. I think the the soonest we've ever seen a supernova um, information, you know, really short term would have been supernova 1987A, because it was just in our neighboring galaxy, and they saw neutrinos from it, uh, and then very sh soon saw the, the light. Um, but I'm not quite sure how quickly they got the actual data on that. Um, so, so I don't actually know all the details on that, unfortunately. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, understanding the early evolution of a supernova explosion is the goal. So, you know, catch, I mean, I know a couple months ago, we were all excited because Betelgeuse was getting really faint and, oh, maybe it was going to blow. And, you know, I kept having dreams of watching Betelgeuse, see it go and phoning up the three meter and say, it just went, move the telescope now, you know, to get the information as soon as possible. And, and I actually, you know, wrote a report on how with something that's going to be as bright as Betelgeuse exploding, we can get data with our three meter telescope without completely saturating our instruments and came up with all sorts of clever techniques to uh, handle that what if situation in case it did go supernova. I, I think a lot of us who are in the, uh, the, the hobby had our friends all approach us during that and said, hey, what's going on with Betelgeuse? Right. Yeah, I think it had a lot of people talking and speculating. I'm sure I'm not the only one that was coming up with observational plans with big telescopes to get really important data. <laughs> And now it turns out it was just a dust cloud or something like that? Yeah, well, I always suspected it was something like that. I didn't actually think it was likely it was it was gearing up for a supernova, but boy, it would have been spectacular if it had. Oh, yeah. Event of a lifetime. Oh, yes. I'm curious about your, um, the arc of your kind of professional career. Mm -hmm. What got you interested in astronomy, where you went to school, and kind of the evolution of your uh, interest in research um, as you've been kind of going through your career? Yeah, so as I've always been interested in math and science. I had a scientific family. My mom is a PhD chemist. My father is a math professor. My stepfather is a physics professor. Um, so, you know, it's not surprising. I was also interested and good at science given that background. Um, I did my undergraduate work at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts and did my graduate studies at University of New Mexico. And uh, ever since I was a kid, I was always fascinated by um, 
galaxies and black holes. And so a lot of my research, which I didn't actually mention at all in the talk, is actually measuring the masses of black holes at the centers of uh, galaxies and uh, understanding the environment around those black holes and their accretion disks. Um, but uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, this new technology called adaptive optics, uh, which allows us to get clearer Im images through our telescopes, uh, you know, by correcting for turbulence caused by the Earth's atmosphere, um, was declassified right as I was starting graduate school in 1991. And I thought, wow, this is great technology. I'd always liked high resolution astronomy, and this was just another tool in the toolbox. And so I went to work for the Air Force, um, working on adaptive optics technologies. Um, started my dissertation topic and then they classified it and so I had to change topics because you can't get a PhD on something that's classified. Uh, so, uh, but when I finished I was still interested in that and Lick Observatory was looking for an adaptive optics uh, astronomer and at that time I was the only PhD candidate with experience with that technology because of my working for the Air Force. So I was very fortunate to get my job here at Lick Observatory uh, straight out of graduate school. Um, which is almost unheard of to get your final permanent position straight out of graduate school. Most people have to do postdocs and, and other research appointments first before getting their permanent job. So that's sort of the, the very short summary of my <laughs> career. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for Eleanor? I was going to show off her gift shop. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say someone very kindly put the link in the uh, chat session. Oh, they did. Okay. Well, here's, here is the uh, gift shop and some of the lovely merchandise they have. Yep. Plug, plug. Yep. Bicycle shirts. Yeah. The bike jerseys are very, very popular. The t-shirts are very popular. Yeah. We have a lot of lovely things. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Nice yeah. Posters, posters and stuff. So yeah, we, we, we process orders a few times a week and ship them out pretty, prop, pretty promptly. So if you need to have your Lick Observatory mug or, or you know, magnet. Shot glass. Uh, shot glass. There. Shot glass, yeah. That looks like a big shot glass. <laughs> a normal size shot glass. Okay. The larger the life on the, no, the computer screen, I guess. <laughs> and it looks rather tall. Yeah, it's, it's tall, but it's skinnier. Oh, okay. So. It's the only, design is um, based on a three meter scope. <laughs> there we go. Ellie, okay. I'm a, a lunar astronomer, mm -hmm. and I it's going on, I want to say, 26 years. I went up to that gift store mm -hmm. and bought, they opened up a door, and I bought, I don't know how many, oh, 16 yeah. by 20 black oh, yeah. and whites that still are my, they're just, absolutely luscious things and when you were referencing that person who did the mm -hmm. the modern picture yeah of the craters there's one and i want to say if my memory serves me lick 21 that mm -hmm. is a composite of that done in uh, what the 30s or something i would no, i think it was actually well the composite may have been done i thought the composite was actually done before them but yeah they took the the first and third yeah. quarter moons yes. and melded them along the terminator so that on the yeah. terminator you have these incredibly well-defined craters yeah yeah no now, it's one years, of the classic images yeah years later when i kept hounding them i'd go up and they they told me progressively Oh, we're running out of, we don't have those. So I assume now all you get are shot glasses in the, in, in the gift shop and t-shirts and not those kind of things. No, the black and white photos are no longer available. Yeah. The original plates for the most part are still available. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's, it is in principle possible to create new images. I see. Um, God, I would love to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> A volunteer. <laughs> oh, also, the, uh, you know, we talked about Russell Crotty's work up there, and there's actually a book uh, that they have up there that is on that exhibit. Oh, yeah, it's a fantastic book. I have yeah. a copy. I had to buy it. Yeah. It was such a great exhibit. It's really well, it's a really brilliantly put together book, so I highly yes. recommend it. Ellie, just one last uh, one question for me. I, um, how many people are still up there? How, what's the minimum 
a group of people that is required to keep that place uh, from falling apart? That's a good question. Certainly more than the minimum population we've had in my career here. Many years ago, when we were having budget cuts and budget problems, the population on Mount Hamilton got to 13 people. Mm. That was insufficient to run the facility full time. We were actually shutting down the Shane three meter telescope for one week a month because we had insufficient staff to operate it. Um, we are now approaching fully staffed right now. We just uh, hired a new support astronomer who started at the beginning of May. Yeah. So our population, if everyone is here on the mountain at the same time, I think we're up to 35 people. Oh. So yeah, it's, it's uh, much more like when I first started working here when the population you know, varied between 35 and 40 people. So uh, we've, we've been through some interesting times in the past 20 years. Well, that's good news. May I ask a question of all of us quickly while we are here? Those satellite, internet satellite things that have been going around and their little things coming up the horizon and going down, are those already in the orbit and those are going to be permanent fixtures of Earth's sky? Get used to it. What's so that? The, the star, I, you know, I, it sounds like you're talking about the Starlink satellites. Yes. Um, when they're first launched, they're quite bright. I don't know if you've seen one of the trains of satellite trails when they're first um, launched. And then they move up to about 500 mile altitude, I believe. Oh. Um, so I might be misremembering, it might be 500 kilometers, I, but I think it's 500 miles because they're mostly talking to an American audience when they're talking about these things. They are designed to be deorbited at the end of their useful lifetime. Is their um, useful lifetime decades? I no. don't know, but I'm assuming yes. Not only that, I mean, my, talking about my, putting 40,000 of them up there. Yes, they are huge numbers and they're not all the only company planning on doing this. So, so yeah. it's quite a problem for astronomy. So um, in addition to the stars, we're gonna have these little moving stars and lines traversing the heavens. Mm-hmm. Well, thank God they didn't put up any moons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and, and you know, it, it's, it's, you know, SpaceX is, I, I, I think they're the ones responsible for Starlink. I think they're, they're trying to work with ways to mitigate the flashes and the brightness um, of the satellites. Uh, there are some things in the works. Um, but it is going to be a problem, particularly for large survey telescopes like the, the LSST. Mm. Um, which will be surveying the entire sky every night and looking for transient objects. And all of a sudden we have thousands of new <laughs> transient <laughs> objects. Um, so so it's, it's, a, it's a software challenge um, ah. to, to predict yeah, those things. They'll be able to mask them, I'm sure. But, you know, uh, it, it, yeah. it's an unnecessary, I mean, I, it's, I can't it's, imagine. It's I, it just seems like it wasn't thought out very well. Oh, no. Well, my, well, that's that's part and parcel of Elon Musk's company. They do things first and then ask for permission later. And they, you know, it sounds like a great idea, but they don't think through all the ramifications. At least that's my opinion. Huh. Um, the more I, I hear from Elon Musk, the less I like him. Uh, yeah. So that's my yeah. personal opinion, not, not the universities or anyone else's, but uh, yeah. yeah. How much is all that space junk interfering with research now? Right now, I think it varies um, depending on where you're looking. I mean, certainly a lot of the satellites interfere with our regular operations with our laser guide star adaptive optic system. Um, any satellite that can be damaged by our laser, we have to uh, stop propagating our laser and worry about it. Yeah. I think these new satellites that are going up in the, you know, the thou by the thousands ultimately aren't going to affect that but uh, you know satellites are an issue already you know i have had i've had data ruined by a satellite going through the middle of my image mm. and, you know, after 20 minutes of exposing i'm like oh man it had to go right through the center of the galaxy which i was trying to measure you know so you just you take another exposure and you just waste time it's it's, it's yeah. unfortunate when it happens it also happens with cosmic rays you're like oh i'm looking at the spectrum and i need to get a really good measurement of the h alpha line and there's a cosmic ray right in the middle of my age alpha line. So nature does it to us too. Um. I've got a question about um, just all the historical archives at Lick. Mm -hmm. And are those 
actively being preserved. And I know, you know, some observatories have a um, program where they digitize their old glass plates and then they don't know what to do with them. You know, what, what sort of issues are you having um, um, with all the historical um, archives? Yeah, so, so we have enormous archives uh, in, in terms, I think only Harvard College Observatory has a larger photographic plate archive than Lick Observatory here in the US. They have a huge grant and a huge program to digitize and scan their plates in a very scientifically useful way. We do not have the space and facilities and certainly not the funding to do that. However, I have hopes that in the future that we'll maybe be able to come up with grant money once Harvard is done digitizing their plates to maybe ship our plates to them for proper scanning and archiving. In the meantime, uh, we do have some volunteers, uh, in particular Tony Mish, who used to be an employee here at Lick Observatory, but is now volunteers in our archive, um, who is cataloging things, particularly the scientific instruments, but also the, the important plates from, in particular E.E. E. Barnard, um, are being uh, recatalogued, put in new envelopes uh, that are, are archival and things like that. So, so we are trying to preserve in priority of importance. So, you know, those Barnard plates and, and log books are particularly important historically. Um, so we're prioritizing and, and spending our time wisely at this point. It's not as big a program as we would like, but uh, we hope in the future we'll be able to make sure everything is preserved. Now, it seems like that uh, the benefits, of, one benefit would be going back and getting a very long baseline to get the proper motions of things you know, over, over 100 years uh, yeah. that, that you might be able, even though those are old grainy photos, but still you could do some kind of statistical. Uh, yeah, and a lot of that was done with the Carnegie Dual Astrograph with the Northern uh, uh, Proper Motion Survey um, that was done here at Lick Observatory. So, you know, but a lot of that has been superseded by Gaia and the, the the space telescopes that really do a, a better job. Hmm. More important historically, is since we have so many plates, is looking at variable stars and variable stars whose variability changes over time. You yeah. know, we have a long baseline. You can look at a plate from 120 years ago yeah. and you know see what it was doing back in time if we have the data available. Now, of course, we didn't observe the whole sky. Not all our plates are still extant. Some disappeared with the people that took them decades ago. Um, so, so our archive is very incomplete, uh, but there's a, there's a gold mine of data there for the people willing to take advantage of it. And are some of these big glass plates? Some of them are very large glass plates. The one Whoa. from the, the Lick Northern Proper Motion Survey are 20 inch square plates. Oh my, and are these all residing over there in that building in a room? Yeah, so, so our, our, we, have, we have two buildings with our plate archive. We have, an arc, we have a couple archive rooms in our lab and measurement building, and mm -hmm. uh, our main archive is in the photographic building. So wow. they're all there adjacent to our visitor center. Mm -hmm. Great talk, Ellie. Yeah. Okay. Really yeah. enjoyable. Yeah, yeah awesome. thank you for having me, and thank you, Roy, for asking me. <laughs> yeah, somehow get you a virtual t-shirt. <laughs> we always give our speaker a t-shirt, which is one of the things with a couple of them on the back. Ah, I see. Well. <laughs> in glow in the dark, so you can't wear it on a Ooh, glow in the dark, GSSP. that makes it awesome. <laughs> John, can you pull any strings and get a GSSP? The new shirt for um, I only ordered one for me and one for my wife. <laughs> I don't think there were really any extras. <laughs> there was a two-week window to place orders for that. Well, Bill, another idea is we ought to just frank with the gift shop and maybe the club can purchase something. Yeah. There you go. But again, Ellie, thank you. This was great. And uh, yeah. I hope this serves uh, for uh, a baseline for many other uh, uh, chats with other organizations. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Ellie, your, the clarity of your expression and the lucidity of the PowerPoints 
were just unparalleled. Usually people have crappy, their sound isn't good, and they can't enunciate, and you know, yeah, no, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. Very great presentation. Yeah. Okay. One of our Michaelis people dropped into the uh, text chat. Uh, ah. Steve, Steve Elstad said that he bought the Immortal Fire Within from the Lick gift shop a couple months ago. It was mm. delivered in a couple of days, also half the price of Amazon. And then he said, Ellie, I believe you discovered a quasar? Well, I, I, I've discovered, you know, galaxies. I've discovered things that we didn't know what we were and de determined they are quasars or active galaxies. Um, yeah, one of my research programs with my collaborator, Mark Lacey, who's part of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and ALMA. Um, you know, we, we've been using uh, various radio telescopes, infrared telescopes, etc., to compare with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to come up with a sample of things that we think are quasars, but they're not the standard quasar colors because they're reddened due to dust extinction or other uh, processes. And so we've been observing them with the CAS spectrograph at uh, here at the, the Shane telescope to measure their red shifts and determine are they actually quasars or active galaxies or are they um, radio stars in our own galaxy because they actually have similar colors and properties in these surveys until you take a spectrum. So, uh, you know, we haven't discovered any radio stars, but we've discovered some, you know, moderately high redshift quasars in our sample. Very cool. Yeah. So, unfortunately, I need to go because I need to do some engineering with the Shane Telescope at this time as we ramp back up to getting research started. But uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, coming. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, Ellie. Bye. Thank you for coming. That was wonderful. Yeah. yeah we all got to hit the clap icon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know I had one. Yeah, reactions has a, a thumbs up and a clap. Oh, oh. Where, where's the reaction? Where's that? that? There's a bunch of icons at the bottom of the window when you float the mouse down there. Yeah. And oh, one of them yeah. says reactions. Well, boy, I don't have that. It's not oh, Apple, no wonder. Yeah, what it's probably I somewhere else on Apple. Wow. Look, look underneath or look above or I don't know. Yeah, it's probably okay. under settings. In Apple, everything's under settings. Yeah. 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 Craig, did you, also did be you see the quick map thing? Your attention to talk. Right. <laughs> Craig, did yeah. you see the quick map thing of, of the moon? The quick yes. Map? And did you wander around? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty cool. Was it Roy who was going to see if he could get that without the, the logo? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't.